All the good guys have already spoken, so I, I know my place when I'm late at night. Uh, the crazy thing happened, though, when we got here uh, yesterday, I couldn't fall asleep. And I think it was about 3.30 this morning when I fell asleep. And uh, that was only till 5 or 6. And then I told Barry, and he said, that's when I woke up, was 3.30. <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be a fun time for all of us. That we'll be standing here in our pajamas and not even know it, I'm telling you. <laughs> Lord, we are so grateful for your tremendous love for each of us. We're grateful that your word, from cover to cover, is so planned out by your genius intelligence beyond anything man has. And we're just grateful that you love us. And as David brought out, before you even formed us, you loved us. Before the foundations of the world, you knew us. That's what you told Jeremiah. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So there are no accidents. And each one of us that are here should be very comforted, Father, because of your great love. And so we pray this weekend will be a deep, rich, spiritual feast for each of us, but also a very happy weekend. A lot of joy is our strength. And we can't thank you enough for having mercy on us, Lord. So we lay our lives at your throne right now and ask in Jesus' name you'll Bless this final message uh, for the evening. Amen. Amen. Um, Barry used a word which I've always enjoyed, twinkling, twinkling of an eye. And um, as a young minister in San Diego, I had the privilege of meeting um, Dr. Uh, John Wesley White, who is an associate evangelist for Billy Graham. And Dr. White is a genius. He's a real genius now because he's in heaven. Um, he uh, earned two PhDs. He was a graduate of Oxford. Just brilliant. But when you talk to him, he's just a regular person. So over the years, uh, we became friends. And I've read all of his books. And I knew that he helped Mr. Graham with his sermons if he was quoting something that was more on the intellectual side so that his message was would reach all the audience, he'd have uh, John Wesley do them for him. So he did a study with this brilliant brain on the word twinkling of an eye. And he, I forget how long he told me he had studied it. But he, he got every book that he had ever had in his whole life. He, he knows all the Hebrew and the Greek and other languages. And uh, he said, I finally came up with the answer. It's faster than a blink of an eye. Blink your eye. That, you'll be in heaven faster than that blink. And he said the closest he could get the word twinkling was to one one trillionth of a second. So when we're gone, we're gone. <laughs> we're gone for good. <laughs> so I was given a, a title of a message here, and I'm going to do my best on all of these. Um, and I don't have my pajamas on, so I know I'm cognizant right now. I was given this t uh, subject for this evening of uh, why we need Jesus. But I know you all already know that, so I'm going to change the subject to the book of Leviticus, chapter by verse. Uh, we all know why we need Jesus, but since this is the Tulare uh, Prophecy Conference, I wove it a little bit into prophecy. And David and I and Barry love prophecy. And we both have the joy of being on his channel every Thursday and doing the World News Briefing, which is a program that Chuck Smith started. And uh, that whole channel is just all day long Bible studies of some of the best teachers around. But, um, I watch the Lord work with Barry that he'll be sitting there and he's very methodical and Everything's all laid out for him. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit inspires him. Or I'll throw him a curveball because I can see that he's being used. And he, he has a lot of the same gifts that Chuck Smith had. I worked with him directly for five years as a new Christian. And 
walked with him around the world for 40 years. And when I met Barry on the set, I thought, oh, I see why Chuck asked that Barry be in this program. Well, there are many reasons we need Jesus, and we don't want to miss any of them. But um, David said it, Ryan said it, Barry said it, you all have said it when I gave you the title, salvation. That's, we'd say that's it right there. We need Jesus because of salvation. But we need him, he's much wider and deeper than just one word for us. We need him for many reasons because you and I live in a hostile environment. More so than ever, Christianity in America is fading away quickly. And uh, it's being turned on right now in the press, in media. And it dawned on me one day that when the press no longer has our president to bash, you know where they're going to bash next? To the Christian community that put him over the top and our freedoms and liberties have already vanished, right to privacy. They're listening in on your phone right now. Uh, the, you know, the right for freedom of speech. Uh, people are getting arrested. Uh, hate speech is the book of Romans, chapter 1, like David said, North America, not just USA, but in Canada, pastors have been arrested. And so they experiment outside, and then they see if it'll work inside our country because nobody's really resisting the fake news or the lies in the education system, we're imploding on ourselves. And unless people like you and I, not just good moral people, but people that have faith, we don't see a revival happen. This country is gone, and the Lord will be back quickly, which we all want. But I'm one of those guys, like Ryan, my heart grieves for a lost soul. I love the body of Christ. I'll die for the body of Christ if necessary. But I've just seen too much darkness in my life prior to Jesus. And I want to encourage you. Don't just be status quo. This is the time to really be on fire. And that only the breeze of going up quickly in the rapture will put that fire out because you have your new body. That'll always be on fire. So why do we need him? Well, in John 10, verse 10, he said, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly, or life to the full, fullness of life. He came to bring life. And uh, the devil came to bring death. He's a murderer. Jesus came to bring life. And when you see what's going on in the Middle East and all the hatred that's been there for centuries, against Jewish people, and then what the JV team did to actually bring genocide in Syria and Iraq to the body of Christ, and our government allowed it to happen, uh, you realize the world's gone. I took two trips to northern Iraq in the peak of ISIS and helped the rescue of some of these young Yazidi women that were sold as sex slaves by ISIS, and uh, the boys and girls, too, five years old and up. I sat face to face with women who watched their Christian husband be decapitated and pushed into the pits. Uh, I, I don't want to tell you everything I saw that or heard from these people in debriefing them, but I was so crushed when I found out there was 1,500,000 thousand Christians out of 1.8 missing since ISIS in just Iraq alone. Less than 300,000 Christians out of almost 200 remain. And nobody stood up and said a word about it. The church is weak. The Christian voice is weak. And it can't be. No matter how old you are, there is something you can do. You all know Corey Ten Boom. And uh, if you've never read The Hiding Place, ladies, read it. World War II, she and her dad and her sister and mom hid Jewish people in Amsterdam in their home at great cost to their lives. Pastor Chuck Smith was her pastor in her latter years. 
And he would go to her house and minister to her because she was bedridden before she died. And one day she said to Chuck, I feel so useless, so spent, that I traveled the world for so many years and now I'm not of any good to anyone, let alone God. And Pastor Chuck reproved her in love and said, that's not true. Because now you have no distractions. You can lay in this bed and you can start over in Europe and work your way through Scandinavia and around the world to South America. You can pray for people all over this globe. And that revived her for a period. None of you are too young. None of you are too old. Jesus needs all of us for this final this final get ready for evacuation planet Earth. And if you've never seen the pit, I've seen it more than one time in my life, and I should be there at night. You would not let your Christianity be flippant. Your heart would break for every human you passed in stores. There was a man that Jesus spit in the mud, made some mud, put it in his eyes. He says, what do you see? I see men like trees, walking, blowing in the wind. And then he said, did a second and he said, I see quite clearly. I found out the body of Christ has blurred vision when it comes to people. And when you're reading that story, I thought, hold it, this man had something that he lost. Because how would he know what a tree blowing in the wind looks like, let alone a man walking, and to juxtapose them together, unless he had lost sight. And maybe you've lost sight, and you walk into a grocery store, and it's a blurred vision. You don't see people. You see your grocery list and try to get the shortest line. <clears throat> but I learned many years ago, I'm in that line because the Lord ordained it, apparently. And I'm going to pray for everybody in front of me and behind me. And I'm a very impatient person. But when I see people now, I'm not impatient because I may be the only person in the world praying for them. And you may be. Every place you go, you are a spiritual evangelist just by your light shining in what you know. And people will no longer be a blur. Each one will be precious and priceless. We take our eyes off ourselves. That's why we need Jesus. Because he looks at people with the filter of love and eternity. And so we want to be open to be used by the Holy Ghost. We are created, the Bible teaches us to have fellowship with God. He loves us. Both right now we're having it. Yesterday we had it, but throughout all of eternity to fellowship with him. And I began to think when I said, why do we need Jesus? And I thought of the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. These are all good things, but they're necessary for us to live on this planet. Without them, we're lost. And uh, these are good things for us. But what did James say? James gave us a little bit of hint why we need Jesus. And you know it, James 1.17. These are all good things, but he said, every good gift, every good thing, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. But I found in my own life at times and other people's lives, we treat God as if there's a variableness in him, like a switch at home and you pull it down and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and you say, oh, we're watching TV. Let's just, a variable this. No, God's light, God's love. He, he doesn't have some little deal where he sneaks up on us. Boo! <laughs> you got to accept Jesus or you're going to die. No. There's no shadows. God doesn't cast a shadow. And if we're in the shadows, we're probably in the flesh. And probably off the straight path that leads to a narrow gate. Jesus said there's two roads. You come to a crossroad. There's a broad one, and there's a narrow one. It's a broad way. It's a path. This leads to destruction. That leads to a narrow gate that takes you to eternal life. I can remember one night, I was on a special air disaster team <coughs> for 9-11. Um, and uh, our days were really long, and our assignments were very tedious and um, had a very high security clearance. My clearance said, no individual or organization can impede my forward progress at ground zero. 
or anywhere in New York City. Uh, and if a cop looked at it, they realized they're not even going to ask a question. I remember one night, there's a bunch of us. We'd been up like 16 hours, and we were exhausted. And we went down to 42nd Street, Times Square. And um, there was nobody in Times Square in New York City. And I s s we were walking to a restaurant, TGIF. And I saw my brother-in-law and sister-in-law getting into a taxi at 11.30 at night. What in the world were they doing there? And they came uh, and wanted to help the economy, which is very nice of him. He is one of the top 100 criminal defense lawyers in America. And uh, for years, the number one in Orange County. And um, I looked at that and I thought, two people I know and nobody else is in Times Square. You see, when people go to the Broadway, every city, even your own, has a Main Street, a Broadway, and there's usually restaurants and theaters and a lot of neon so people will come back at night. And just get the image of, of any town. There is a Main Street and it's where the action is, no matter how small the town. And uh, the teenagers get in their cars and go up and down and wave at each other and, you know, and go like this to each other and whatever, just to pass the time away. But that ends in death. In this narrow path, you see your friends going that way and you're going to go somewhere that you've never touched or felt or smelled or seen. Your senses have no clue. It's something called faith inside of your heart. We need Jesus because we need the faith. We need Jesus because he has the road map. I remember with Chuck Smith one time, I, he was helping me through a, not an immoral uh, trial, but a, but a trial that was very, very painful. And uh, he said, don't defend yourself. If you defend yourself, you have a weak defense. Let Jesus handle this. So I'd be bawling my eyes out and I'd call him and say, please, please pray. And he'd say, get in your car and drive up here. Well, it's an hour and a half without traffic each way. For four years he'd do that. But Chuck, I won't be there till 6 or 6.30. You'll be gone. I'll wait for you. And he'd wait. And the first time I sat there just crying for an hour. And um, it was just things that people did that were not right and it affected a lot of other people and hurt them. And I couldn't understand why people you love and trust and open doors for and help that all of a sudden they pull a knife out and start You've had that happen as a pastor before, I think. Um, so after four years of this, I walked up to Pastor Chuck as one of the last pastor's conferences. And uh, he was walking up the podium to be the speaker. I was like about there. And I said, hey, Pastor Chuck, I just want to tell you thank you. I, for the first time in four and a half years, I feel, I just feel like the Lord has taught me a deep, deep lesson. And I'm starting to feel like I could be used or so, I just feel good. He said, I'm so happy for you, Mike. So now all the pastors are getting in there, about 700, and they're sitting down, and I'm walking up the aisle, and I'm the speaker, Chuck's at the mic, says, Mike. So I turned around in the middle. Everybody looks over, what's he doing? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, there will be bigger mountains to climb. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> We need Jesus because you're all going to have, you know it, th there are always bigger mountains. And I wanted that to be my final <laughs> mountain. Well, to be final, I'd have to be in heaven. As long as I'm breathing, I need to love you, to inspire you. I need Jesus in my life to help people that are floundering and headed toward the darkness. That's a good reason that we need Jesus. Would you turn to the Gospel of John? It's been quoted several times. I'd like you to look at chapter 1, if you would, for just a moment. And uh, <clears throat> this is a reason for sure. Listen very carefully. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's amazing. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Nothing. And you listen like David was showing that picture of Einstein. 
and you listen to present day scientists about, uh, like on the History Channel or Nature or Science Channel, and uh, they're talking about the moons around Saturn, they're talking about these planets, they don't have a clue what they're talking about. He made them, all of them. And you know, just, I think Barry and I talked about this about four months ago, around the Christmas season, I think, but they had just discovered 300,000 new galaxies. Did they surprise God because they have a telescope out there called Hubble that just discovered 300,000 galaxies, not stars, galaxies. Man is so sharp. He's on the cutting edge. <laughs> what are they going to do when they find one billion galaxies that they didn't know about? You think of the magnificence of God. You know, just Orion. The Bible tells us he put the stars out there by his fingers. How big is that hand? Spans the universe. It would have to to pick up a star and put it out there. And yet that big hand in Revelation says he shall wipe every tear away. And I think I might have mentioned this last year. Can you put on one hand the number of people in your lifetime you've ever let touch your face, let alone wipe a tear off? And every time I try it, I go, Grandma? Grandma? <laughs> Mom? And yet, these stars in Orion, the three stars perfectly, so you can say, oh, that's Orion because that's his belt buckle. Up there on that left shoulder is a orange star called Betelgeuse. And it's a pulsating star. It's like your heart. Boom, 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 boom. Otherwise, it expands. And it contracts. When it's at its smallest diameter, contracted, it's 270 million miles around. Planet Earth is 25,000. When it expands out, it's 400 million miles around. Do you think he's smarter than all of us? I think so. <laughs> but think of the size of that one star. It, uh, it dwarfs our star. It's an amazing thing. He calls them all by name. And he's numbered them. I don't even know where my car keys are right now. <laughs> and yet, we limit God. It's sad to see people that believe in God limit him. But the more you spend in the word, the more you spend in prayer, the more you see him walking with you to love and help other people, the deeper your relationship comes and all of a sudden all the blurriness goes away and you realize we've only got a little bit of time left and who needs to come to the Lord? And it may be somebody at your high school they could be the most rowdy party boy in the school. Maybe somebody at work. There's nobody out of reach. But you may be the vessel to start praying for the traffic jam at 5 o'clock coming from Visalia back here or going the other way. Instead of griping, I'd like to pray for the people in that truck in front of me. Lord, you know them, I don't. People behind me, you know them, I don't. But would you have mercy on their soul? Imagine the revival that would break out just in this town alone in the area of California. you got to admit, California has gotten really weird. And, it's, <laughs> and it's, it's not necessarily because we're living here, but I mean, loosey-goosey. <clears throat> so all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. That settles it. In him was life. Uh, and all of you have it, and the life was the light of men. You look at the teenagers and the young men and women here, and if you're older, you think, I remember when I was young. Uh, I don't remember it very well, but I do remember I was young. When I was 50, I was always an athlete. I'd never had a broken bone in my life, or, and I was a troublemaker as a pre-Jesus guy. And... Um, I'd get knocked around most of the time, but once in a while, I just wouldn't, I didn't like bullies. 
and sometimes I'd be looking up at him like this, and I'd be across the street with my teeth smiling over there and my body over here. <laughs> but I wasn't afraid of being that. Barry was telling me that it's hard to see him and to know that he was a scrapper too. But when I became a Christian, it all became new. And I ran a lot. I, I loved track in high school and football, wrestling. So on my 50th birthday, I was working out, and a friend of mine who's a cop, San Diego, his family owned uh, fitness centers in San Diego. So he, he worked for six months before my 50th birthday to get me to be able to bench press my weight, which was 200 pounds. And uh, on my 50th birthday, I actually bench pressed 200 pounds. It was pretty good weight. And then I went down to the beach and I ran three miles. But when I turned 60, I bench pressed about 75 pounds. <laughs> and I ran about 300 yards. <laughs> I had a birthday just a couple days ago. And when I turned 70, I was able to get in my Mustang and to drive to Lindsay, California and be here with all of you. <laughs> <clears throat> all things were made through him, without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light that's inside of us if we're older or younger. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness, it didn't comprehend it. Now there's a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, like we're not that light, but was sent to bear witness, like we've been sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into this world. What an opportunity that we had as little babies, but what a lack of opportunities babies have today. 65 million is hitting right here in our country. We'd have no problems at all. Probably one of those 65 was gifted by God to have the cure to AIDS. Probably one of them had to the, the gift to figure out how to get to Mars. You go on and on and on, 65 million people, we'd be, we'd be debt free. Imagine the tax base of those 65 million people. Our country wouldn't be 21 or 23 trillion, trillion dollars in debt. But yet, the loss of natural affection is a sign of the end times. When we stop loving one another, our hearts are going to get rotten. Greater love has no man than this, but to lay his life down for his brethren. I think I'm getting into tomorrow's message of the love of God. Sorry. Um, he was not that light. He was in the world. The world was made through him, this planet. The world did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish people. His own did not receive him. Hey, where'd you get those... Scars in your hands. Remember the Old Testament? Uh, in the house of my brothers. And you know, some of the deepest scars every one of us in this room have, have been in the house of our brothers, our families. We don't pull punches when we're brothers and sisters growing up. Now it'd be called hate speech or something. But... Uh, I get punched again by my bigger brother if I said, hey, that's hate speech. Well, good. <laughs> um, I have a friend, Calvary Chapel, uh, Hudson Valley, New York. Uh, the pastor is such a crazy dude. Um, he grew up with eight kids in Yonkers. He talks like a Yonker, which you say, what does that sound like? That's exactly it. You don't know what it sounds like. Um, Bobby Hargraves, he's about that much wider than I am, and about the same height, maybe a little big. I mean, big arms, everything. Um, he was a detention officer for his career, and even did it as the pastor. Uh, the sister got the one bedroom in their Yonkers high rise in the lower income neighborhood. They're one of the only white families in that area, New York City. and. The seven brothers shared one bedroom, and mom and dad, their entire life, as these kids were growing up, slept on the couch in the living room. Very frugal. Just, I said, well, Bobby, first time in, I said, uh, I, I, you, I know where you lived, and um, there's a lot of gangs there, and you don't have a very good tan, buddy. 
Uh, did they beat you up on the way to school? Oh, we got beat up every day. But they learned after a couple of years. You pick on one Hargrave, you got six more, seven more coming to back you up. And he said, but the crazy thing is, and you would say this is crazy, they're all crazy, all the brothers, they love to get hit. <laughs> and they love to fight. We love that they'd come at us with boom, hit you, know, that hurt a little bit, but take this, boom, boom. <laughs> I said, you're nuts. He said, I know it. He said, I actually knocked a guy out at the church parking lot here. I said, what? He was coming and hassling some girls and grabbing them on the way out the parking lot. I just went, boom. I said, did you say, in Jesus' name, I'm sorry? He said, no, I wasn't thinking. The police came and they said, just get in your office, Pastor, and we'll take care of this. <laughs> he came to his own. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children. He's given all of us in this room tonight and on the Internet to become children of God. To the people, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus. We beheld his glory, awesome. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You remember, there was a day that a centurion stopped Jesus. And he said, I have a servant at home, so here's love. A boss concerned about an employee. I have a servant at home, he's, he's sick. And Jesus said, then I shall go heal him. He said, no, you don't have to do that. For I'm, I'm a man of like authority. I say to this soldier, would you go get that? And he gets it, would you come over here? And he comes over here. No, no, I understand. You just say the word. I believe. Wow, in all of Israel, I'm not sure I've seen so much faith. So he said, go your way, your servant's healed. And as he's on his way home, somebody runs up to him and says, your servant who is sick is now healed. And the centurion said, about what time was that? And it was the time that Jesus said, go home, he's healed. Remember that? Then do you remember when darkness covered all the land and the veil was ripped in two and two thieves were mocking him and that whole scene on the cross, how painful I mean, the painfulness of having your back ripped open by the cat of nine tails, the nine strips of leather with bone or metal, it would just be a cat's claw, and it would rip open your uh, skin. But it, didn't st it went through the fascia tissue, it went through the derma, it went through the, uh, uh, what do you, the ligaments, the muscles, and more than likely, spinal fluid was coming out. It was raw nerve endings at his spine. Whack, whack, whack. And the pain, the headache. They take his beard and they take it with chunks of flesh off of his face. They played a crown of thorns on his head. He, and that's where we have more capillaries. We, we bleed very easily from a head injury and you look like you're gonna die. Uh, but his face had to be covered in the back. And he's got his feet propped up there and he's hanging on. And his hands are nailed to the cross, and the feet are nailed, and that little thing he had to breathe just to get oxygen up. And this man's talking to him that needs to be saved, and he's not saying, don't bug me right now. <laughs> I mean, you know who you are. I was in the bathroom there and said, hey, Pastor Mike, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, after I go to the bathroom. <laughs> And then somebody walked in after he heard him say that, and he said, hey, how are you doing? I haven't seen you. Can I ask you a question? And that first man said, yeah, after I go to the bathroom. <laughs> Do you realize that? A man is going to go into hell. And Jesus, with all that agony, and trying to keep the lungs up, and trying to keep the breath up, and his triceps are failing, his biceps, and the blood that every 23 seconds goes from the sole of our feet up to our brain, down through our heart, back down. It's but the heart's getting tired. And he's not thinking about himself. I tell you what, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so when you think of that, of that sacrifice. That's one reason we need Jesus. We need to live like he lived. 
We need to die to ourselves, die to ourselves as he died to himself. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. You know that verse? Nevertheless, I live. But yet not I, it's Christ who lives in me. In this life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It was a great revelation one day when I was reading that verse. And I'd read it many times. And I realized, hey, he's not just quoting a religious statement here. He truly saw himself crucified with Christ. That's a whole experience most of the church misses, don't you think, Dave? The people actually realize he's not just their Savior, he's their Lord. I'm crucified, Paul said, but nevertheless I live, and it's not because I'm alive, it's because he's inside of me. And how did he get there? He loved me and he gave himself for me. So on that cross, we need him because we're all going to be crucified for Christ. And yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. I've been at a lot of death scenes. 36 years I've been with the San Diego Police Department, and I've seen people die any way you couldn't imagine. From teenagers in knife fights, gun fights, gang stuff, to old people, young people, you name it. And we need Jesus when we get through that valley. And nobody's going to walk through it. Mommy's not. Daddy's not. We're all going to walk through that valley. And I saw it with my mom. And my mom went to heaven uh, two, two weeks before 92. And when it was her time, uh, I realized where she was. And she sat up in her bed. Oh! And she was in pain. And the doctor was walking by, hey, come here, this is my mom. You hear her, what she's moaning? She's, he said, well, give her something. I said, please. And I think it was when she was going through the valley of the shadow of death. She died a few hours later. But remember, death is only a shadow. And it's our last thing leaving this all behind and you'll be on your own. But he'll be with you. And goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life, right up to the end. And in a moment, in a twinkling, one, twenty, one trillionth of a second, you should be changed. No more pain. At all. No more suffering. It's amazing how much he loves us. And the word became flesh, we beheld his glory. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he is before me. And of his fullness we have all received and grace uh, for grace. So you stop and you think of this great, tremendous love and you see those first three verses that he made everything. He was the word. He was with God. He was God. He's in the beginning with God. And then you look at something like verse 12. As many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And there's a man sitting here tonight that I will not forget to pray about. He confessed sin to me. I'm a complete stranger. He wept over his sin, and we prayed together. David said, are some of you not sure? And several of you raised your hand. It's not a religion. It's you with your best friend. I no longer call you servants, Jesus said. Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I call you friends. Abraham has my epitaph on my tombstone or the twig they're going to put up for me, or whatever it is. Friend of God. When I first read that, the Bible, my first time through, friend of God. I can actually be a friend of God? Yeah. And he's your friend. I'm not being disrespectful here. 
because we can cry out, Abba, Father, with a cry of adoption. I was in a lot, which is down by the Red Sea, waiting for our tour group to come to uh, Tel Aviv. And I was there two days, three days earlier, just resting up from my schedule. And I wanted to be healthy and strong for him. And so we were sitting by the swimming pool of this hotel. And a young uh, Israeli couple, late 20s maybe at the oldest, and their little daughter, about three years old maybe. And they're speaking, you know, Hebrew. They're talking to each other there. And I'm, I'm just listening. I'm enjoying getting the tan. And I'm just listening. And just without even knowing the language, you could hear the love between the man and the woman, mom and dad, and their love for the little girl. So dad is going to teach her to swim. She's not going for it. And he puts these little donuts on her arms. And he says, now you come with me. Abba, 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 Abba. And he gets her halfway out there, and she's really a high octave now. And she gets all the way to the side with dad. And he says, now you're going to come back. No, Abba, 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 Abba. And he starts going to him. And she, he, she goes after him. And all of a sudden, she saw she was paddling and floating and Abba, 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 Abba. I don't need you anymore. You can get out of the pool, Dad. I can do this all by myself. <laughs> and I understood what a joy that is for you and me to be able to say Abba, Father. It's Daddy. I didn't have a dad, so it was hard for me to understand he's, he's my father. But I had the joy before my dad died, the abusive alcoholic guy that I never grew up with, that I hated with all my guts, to pray with him to confess his sins and his alcoholism and all the lives he ruined and to ask Jesus to come into his heart. God can do anything. And friends will do anything for friends. He'll help you. He doesn't condemn. Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But he said after that, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Everybody thinks he came to bash heads. He came to save you and me. Those are just a couple of reasons I think we need Jesus. We can't do it without him. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Nothing whatsoever. So we're all ready to go. And I want to thank you all for being here. I've waited for a year to be back here. It's a sweet neighborhood, sweet people. (laughs) Don't take what you have for granted. Everything you do should be through the filter of love for other people. And it's hard when it's your enemy. And it's hard when you're dealing with bozos that say they represent God. And it's hard when life is hard. It's hard. And it doesn't get easier. There'll be bigger mountains to climb. But if we're faithful going up the mountain with the Lord and faithful to go down the mountain into the valley with the Lord, God is able to do far exceedingly above anything you can ask or imagine. A lot of people say, I want to get in and get all those rewards that are mine for believing, those helmets, or excuse me, those halos. And I say, I like baseball. And I hope I can just run and slide through the gate and St. Peter goes, safe! (laughs) And the devil, out. God bless you.